ATP rated pilot Jerry Buckheit shown here and his ATP rated co-pilot are going to have a hell of a story to tell when they recover from their injuries in the hospital following the crash landing of their 2014 Cessna 750 Citation X jet. Shortly after takeoff, this crew was faced with an electrical fire, smoke in the cockpit, electrical failure, and apparently a runaway nose down trim condition. The NTSB preliminary report is out. Let's check it out. This accident occurred back on the 5th of August and was a very short flight departing the Dunkirk, New York airport in Chautauqua County and proceeding only 23 miles and less than eight minutes before doing the emergency descent and crash landing at the Jamestown airport. Here's a picture of the aircraft shortly after the crash landing while being consumed by the post-crash fire and the crew had successfully evacuated the aircraft out of the one left or main crew door. There were no passengers on board the aircraft. And here's a picture of the aircraft after the post-crash fire that's in the NTSB report. Here's the NTSB preliminary report from 5 August, the Cessna 750 November 750 Gulf Bravo. One serious injury, one minor injury, FAR Part 91. On 5 August 2024, about 10, 11 Eastern Daylight Time, the Cessna 750 November 750 Gulf Bravo I assume that's named after the owner, was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near Jamestown, New York. The pilot was seriously injured and a co-pilot sustained minor injuries. The airplane was operated by Access Stripe, Inc., uh, Title 14 FAR Part 91 business flight. Access Stripe is Jerry's highway striping business. The airplane departed Chautauqua County, Dunkirk Airport, New York, and was en route to Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale, Florida to collect airplane parts and a mechanic for work on another company airplane back at DKK. Preliminary ADSB data reveal that the pilot obtained an instrument flight rules clearance, IFR, and climbed to 10,000 feet. The Buffalo, New York approach controller advised the flight to expect a clearance to flight level 470 in about 10 minutes, but received no reply. After multiple unsuccessful attempts to reach the flight crew, the controller contacted Cleveland Center to see if the flight had switched over to the Cleveland radio frequency. After more unsuccessful attempts, the controller began transmitting on emergency, the guard frequency, 121.5, and noted that the target identified as the accident aircraft flight displayed an emergency transponder code of 7700. As it descended through 7,800 feet, the controller announced that the airplane was directly over Jamestown Airport without reply. So right there tells me that the pilot in command is taking charge of the situation and is diverting immediately to the nearest suitable airport. Later, the Buffalo controller established intermittent contact with the flight crew that included a very garbled transmissions. The last transmission from the flight crew included, we are about to land at Jamestown. Track data revealed the airplane climbed on a southerly track and leveled about 10,000 feet MSL for only about one minute before it entered a descent. The airplane passed west of Jamestown and initiated a left descending, decelerating 270 degree turn to align with runway 25. And if we look at the ADSB data, he was moving along well in excess of over 300 knots in his emergency descent on the downwind, left downwind for runway 25. The final target or ADSB data point showed the airplane lined with the runway at 1625 feet and 150 knots. The airplane impacted the ground in a flat attitude about 200 feet before the approach end of runway 25 at Jamestown, which is located at an elevation of 1,723 feet. And here's what that data looks like on the NTSB report, just a slight overshoot to the runway 25. The pilot was not immediately available for interview due to his injuries. The co-pilot reported that about 5,000 feet in the initial climb, he smelled electrical smoke, but the pilot did not. The co-pilot then no longer detected the smell, but as the airplane reached about 8,000 feet in the climb, both pilots detected the smell of electrical smoke. Both pilots stated that there was an odor of smoke, but no visible smoke. As they descended through about 10,000 feet, the co-pilot said he heard the clacker for the pitch trim and that the airplane was trimming down and accelerating well over 250 knots with the nose trimming down. The co-pilot said the master caution and panel segments illuminated along with other CAS crew alerting system messages. He tried to contact the controller before he noticed that COM2 had failed and the Garmin 5000 had big red X's.
So your flat panel is gone. The co-pilot described the actions of both crew members after landing as the cabin filled with smoke and they assessed their best path for egress as the airplane was surrounded by fire. Eventually, the pilot opened the main cabin door and both crew members egressed the airplane without assistance. Information about the pilots, the crew, the pilot held an ATP air transport pilot certificate with ratings for airplane single engine land and C and airplane multi-engine land and C and multiple type ratings. His most recent FA second class medical was on September of 23 with 17,000 hours of flying experience. The co-pilot also had an ATP rating, a first class medical and 12,950 hours total flight experience. The aircraft was manufactured in 2014, had the Rolls-Royce engines, and had about 2,677 hours total time on the airframe. The airplane initially impacted terrain and runway lighting 200 feet before the approach end of runway 25. The airplane continued along the runway center line beyond the runway 1331 intersection. So that would be on runway 25 and beyond this intersection here and came to a rest about 225 feet from the runway's left edge, about 2,150 feet beyond the initial impact point. Control continuity was established from the cockpit to all flight control surfaces, except for the left speed brake and spoiler cable, which were destroyed in the post-crash impact fire. The engines were examined visually and also determined thermal damage consistent with the post-crash fire, but there was no evidence of pre-impact mechanical anomaly. The co-pilot stated that he monitored engine function throughout the flight and there were no CAS or crew alerting system messages that related to the engines and that neither engine had malfunctioned. A cockpit voice recorder was recovered and retained for examination and download. This is going to be a very interesting story to find out what happened to this citation. The first thing I always look to as a mechanic is what was the last thing that was worked on on board that aircraft that could have possibly led to this electrical fire, smoke in the cockpit, and ultimate electrical failure resulting in this crash landing. Fortunately, the weather was day VFR, and I believe this model of aircraft not only has um, oxygen masks on, but a smoke mask as well. And when you get in one of these uh, smoke-filled cockpit situations, that smoke mask or smoke goggles may be your only hope of being able to see outside of the aircraft or even just the instruments if the smoke is that bad in the cockpit. This is a pilot's worst nightmare scenario situation. And as we've learned from the past back here in the Swiss Air situation years ago, you do not want to mess around with one of these electrical fires. You want to get this aircraft on the ground as soon as possible. So good job, Jerry, and best wishes to you and your co-pilot for your hasty recovery from your injuries. And we find out more as to what happened to this aircraft and how this crew handled this emergency and basically walked away from a very desperate situation. Thank you so much for your support, especially the folks on Patreon that support this channel. See you here.